morning, church. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to sing together this morning. All right, here we go. Just one word. Oh, just one word. You calm the storm that surrounds me. Yeah, just one word. The darkness has to retreat. We believe that. Oh, just one touch. I feel the presence of heaven. Yeah, just one touch. My eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that I God can't do. It's not a mountain that. Praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that a God can do. In just one word, you heal what's broken inside. Yeah, just one word, and you revive every dream. Yes, you do, God. In just one time. the power of Jesus. So let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe. Sing it. For greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. a seat. Welcome to the church next door. We are so glad you have joined us. Whether this is your first time here 
or if this is the church you call home, we want to make sure you have filled out a connect card. This card helps us get to know you a little bit better so that if you don't call this church home yet, we can help it feel like home. Once you have filled out this card, take it over to our Welcome Center for a free gift to remember your first time here. We can't wait to get to know you better and just want to thank you for not only taking that first step to get to know us, but for valuing the importance of experience Christ in the community. Our mission at the church next door is to help move people closer to God. Our regular weekend service times are on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 9.20 a.m. and 11 a.m. You can join us at those times here inside the church or online on Facebook Live, YouTube, or on our website. Teens Next Door, we are throwing a Super Bowl party here at the church. On February 11th, we are playing pickup football out back, and at 6 p.m., we're throwing the big game on the big screen. And of course, it would be incomplete without wings. We are getting freshly cooked wings by our very own Uncle Ike with a selection of sauces. So join us on February 11th for free wings and the big game. See you then. On Monday, February 5th at 7 p.m., we will be having Next Steps. Next Steps is our chance to get to know each other better. We meet for just one hour, have some pizza, and learn about your next step in God's kingdom. You'll find out about our church history and the Jesus way. So if you'd like to join us, just text Next Steps to 888-644-4034. We look forward to seeing you there.
on the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me, my Jesus set me free. Look at the wounds that give me life, grace flowing from his side, no greater sacrifice. What he's done, what he glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what He's done. So sing for the freedom He has won. Even death is dead. is knowing that we will not be left behind, that you are true, that you are steadfast to your promises, to your people. Of your life, of your testimony. 
testimony, going to the cross, dying for us, but not staying dead, resurrecting. And today we stand in that resurrection power, confident in you, God, confident in you, knowing that you are moving right here, right now. Would you just teach us today, guide us, lead us, that others might know your goodness. We love you, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Hey, it's great singing with you. Why don't you just take a second and greet those around you. Get to know them. You got a second. If there's somebody across the room you want to say good morning to, you can. And those of you online, why don't you leave a comment? We'd love to get to know you as well. Jennifer, and this is the time in our service where we take up a weekly offering, and you can do that at the boxes in the back of the room, on your phone, online. Welcome everyone watching online. We're so glad to have you. Have, have you ever been in such a desperate place for God's provision? Just all that you could think about was if he doesn't show up, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's not going to work out. Well, that was the widow in 2 Kings chapter 4. Her husband had died, and I don't know why, but he didn't have retirement and he didn't have insurance. She had two sons, and they were going to take her sons away to pay off her debts. And Elisha comes, and he says to her, do, what do you have in the house? She says, I don't have anything. Have you ever felt like that? What do you have? I don't have anything. He said, no, let's look around. She had one jar, one little jar of anointing oil for the body. And he said, if you'll give that and go ask all of your neighbors and all of your friends for empty jars, let's see what God will do. Can you imagine how humbling that was at that moment? So she goes to the entire community and collects jars, she and her son, and they come back into the secret place into the quiet prayer closet, because that's where miracles happen, right? And in there, God began to pour oil, jar after jar after jar, and provided all that she needed. She sold the oil and had enough to live on. That is what God wants to do in your life. And I don't know if you're the widow, or if you're all the friends and neighbors, and you're like, I have jars, I have extra, I can help. Well, that is what God wants to do in offering. He wants to show up. He wants to miraculously multiply and be more than enough for all that you need personally in those widow moments and all that we need as a community and as a church. He will multiply it. Let's pray over that. Can you agree? God, I thank you today. We come to you as widows. Lord, we come to you as friends and community and helpers. And God, we say, here are the jars but we can't fill them, Lord, only you. Lord, would you fill the jars to overflowing? And we thank you, God, that you will bless this offering and you are always a God of more than enough. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. You look good. You know, have I told you lately I love you? I love you. If no one's told you they've, they've loved you lately, I do, all right? I'm glad you came to church. I'm glad you're here with me. Do me a favor, put your hands together and welcome everybody online. Let's let them know we love them too, all right? We love you. So before we, before we dive into the lesson, I just wanna say two things. Number one, we're gonna have communion today. And so if you're online, you might want to get those things together, all right? Get some grape juice and a cracker, whatever you've got, okay? But number two, tomorrow is the first Monday of the month. And, and we want to invite you to fast and pray with us. We want you to give up breakfast and lunch. If you've never fasted before, just give up one meal. I know you fasted a meal at some time. You've gotten busy working, and you were doing something, and the next thing you know, oh, wow, I, I totally, I, I didn't eat. 
You survived, okay? You'll survive, but this is what I want you to know. We're doing this to humble ourselves before God and, and ask him to move in our hearts and to move in our land, okay? And we need to change. We need to see what God's doing, and that's why we're doing it, okay? So we're talking about small habits, big difference. Small habit. And today what we want to do is we want to put it all together, and I'm actually going gonna, gonna to give you three keys, all right? I'm going to give you three keys to really in, engaging this way of life and, and put it into play. So before you go, you're going to walk away with three keys today, and I want you to be encouraged by that, okay? But before we dive in, I want to tell you a story about me in college, all right? When I was in college, I think it was, my, it was about two and a half years in, I started out in college in engineering, okay? So I was taking all this math and all these, uh, these classes that were engineering drawing courses and, and just crazy, nutsy math classes, okay? And they were nutsy math classes. There were rooms with this many people in them and we're studying calculus, like you could learn anything that way. It was just really tough, you know? We're taking chemistry and all this. But then in that, that second, I don't know, two and a half years, they put me in an industrial engineering class. And we got to solve problems that impacted real people. And it was so much fun. It was like finally my sweet spot. Does that make sense? And what I want you to see is this. What we're going to learn today, what I'm going to give you, is all this other stuff that we've been learning, but we're going to get you in your sweet spot, and you're going to learn how to apply it in your life, okay? I want you to open up your Bibles to John chapter 3. And if you've got notes, pull them out. If you're online, you can pull up the online notes, okay? The reason is this. In John chapter 3, Jesus is in Jerusalem, okay? Now, I want to read you something from John chapter 2 to set this up, okay? It says in John chapter 2, verse 21, it says, Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. Verse 23, But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what it was, what was in man. All right? I wrote in the margin of my Bible right there, okay, my physical Bible, Jesus was cautious about people. I mean, think about that. Jesus knew that, that people can be wrong, that people can treat you wrong. Now, hold it. That means that God understands people, doesn't he? He understands you and I. Now, the next scene Chapter 3, now you have to understand something. A lot of times we get confused by the, the verses and the chapter markings in the Bible. Those were put in later so you and I can have a conversation and talk about where we're at, okay? It was written just like you write a letter. You don't write a letter and put numbers next to each sentence, do you? No, because it's not going to be a reference letter. If it is, it's a really good letter. Never written one like that, all right? Chapter 3, we go into chapter 3, and this is what it says. It's about new birth. It says, now there was a, a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, let's call him Nick to make it easier, all right, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. That means that Nicodemus is a little, he doesn't want everybody to see him going. Maybe you had to sneak out to church today. Maybe you're hiding under the covers and watching online. You don't want people to know. You know what I'm saying? I'm checking this God thing out. I'm not so sure yet. That's okay. That's how many of us got here, wasn't it? We had lots of questions. We wanted to make sure the water was fine, you know, before we jump in. And, and see, this is where Nicodemus is. But let me give you a little bit of the context because Nicodemus, it says he's a Pharisee, part of the ruling council. That means that he knew the high priest. That means he got invited to all the great parties. He got to see inside the temple. He got to see what was going on in Jerusalem. He knew all the rules. Every Sabbath, he took off. He was following all the rules and all this stuff. But he watches Jesus. When Jesus comes to Jerusalem and he sees Jesus perform miracles, he hears what Jesus is teaching and he's like, Jesus has got something that we don't have. And, and like you and I, some of us, we may have grown up in church. 
Some of us, we didn't grow up in church, but we visited church and we kind of participated for a little bit and we're like, ah, this is not for me. And, and this is what, what Nicodemus is, is kind of struggling with. He's like, I've spent years, years, and this isn't working for me. Do you know, there's some Christians that have been deconstructing is the language they're using. They say, I spent years and now I've got questions. And see, this is where Nicodemus was. He's like, I, I can't do this if it's just a religious thing. It's not working for me. And he comes to Jesus because why? Jesus is impacting reality. Jesus is practical. Jesus is real with people. And that's what you have to see, all right? Verse, I think we're on verse three, right? Jesus replied to him, very truly I tell you, no one, say no one. That means no one, all right? Just want to be clear. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. So Jesus puts a, a qualifier. Jesus is saying, Nick, I know you're wealthy. I know you're part of the, the ruling class, but you're not gonna see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Jesus just totally put Nick out here. He said, you're not gonna make it, bud. I love you. I'm glad you snuck out to meet me, but you ain't making it. How would you feel if Jesus looked at you and told you you were going to hell? There's a lot of people that think that Jesus was always sugar and spice and everything nice. That was not very nice what he said to Nicodemus, was it? I'm gonna say something not nice. You can grow up your whole life in church and still not know Jesus, not be born again. See, this is, this is the tension that, 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 that we feel as we read this passage. Look what Nick, Nick does. He replies with very logical response to Jesus, appropriate response. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. That's obvious. That ain't happening. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one, once again, Jesus says no one, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. <clears throat> you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. See, Jesus says, you, you ought to know this by now. You've been hanging out with godly people. You've been reading the Bible. You ought to know this, and you've missed it. Does that, does that mean that you and I, yes, we can hang it out, we can, we can read the Bible, we can, we can, and we can still miss it? Verse 8, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear the sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now, how can this be, Nicodemus asked. So what is, what is Jesus saying here? Listen, I'm not gonna unpack the whole chapter. You should read the rest of it today, all right? He goes on in this same chapter. Jesus gives one of the most famous verses that, that in terms of my lifetime, John 3, 16. Jesus says, he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is this context. So what's Jesus talking about when he says that you and I need to be born again, that we need this new life? Jesus is saying, you were born into this world and in this world, you are sinful. And if you believe that you are going to change who you are through religious effort, you are wrong. A list of rules will not get you into relationship with God. Now, will there be rules that you need to follow because you're in a relationship with God? Yes, but the list won't get you there. See, you need to engage God and you have to say, God, I need your help. I need you to save me. God, I, I, I give my life to you. God, I recognize that I have been living ungodly. I've been living outside your will. I've been living according to my desires and not according to your des desires. Now, we talk about this as Christians, and a lot of times we, we've called the sinner's prayer that beginning point. But you need to know it's just a beginning point. It's just a sliver. It's not everything. 
And some people would have you believe that if you've said the sinner's prayer, you're done, that that's what it is to be a Christian. No, that's, that's like saying, I went to a wedding, I was the groom, and that was the end of the marriage. No, 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 no. Folks, I've been married for 32 years. The wedding was just the beginning. The 32 years, that's the real deal. This imagination, because you said the sinner's prayer, you've got everything you need to know, an immediate download from God, and, and your firmware has been changed, and no. No, that's not, that's not reality, see? So when Jesus is saying to, to Nicodemus, he's saying, Nicodemus, I need you to repent of thinking that you can be godly through human effort, and you now need to have a work of the Spirit. See, Jesus said a work of the flesh will only produce the flesh, but a work of the Spirit will change who you are at the core. And so Jesus said, you've got to be born again. Now, this is what, this is what we can say about Nicodemus. All the evidence from the Christian story is he made it, and this is why. Nicodemus was there uh, preparing Jesus' body for burial. Jesus, Jesus was so much an important part of his life, he was willing to be identified with Jesus at the worst moment of his life, Bef before the ruling council and before the Romans. So just know this, Nicodemus made it, okay? Don't worry about Nick. Don't worry about Nick. So what was Jesus talking about? Well, Jesus is talking about the two keys to steadfast living. He says, when you're born again, you know your identity. You know who, who birthed you, all right? Did you have any power over your birth? No. You just showed up and sucked air, right? In the same way, you, you have no power over your new birth. You show up and you breathe in the spirit of life from God. You, what did Jesus, in John chapter Chapter 20, verses 19 and 20, Jesus breathes on the disciple and says, peace be with you. You're forgiven. Receive the Spirit of God. So God breathes on you. And see, when you and I, when we know he's the one that's given us new birth, that's the wind Jesus is talking about here. Secondly, when you know your identity, you know I'm God's child, you also know that God has a plan for you, that you're going to live for him. You're going to live differently now. I'm no longer who I used to be. And that's why we know that Nicodemus was changed because he was not worried about appearances after Jesus was crucified. He was willing to be identified with Jesus. He went before the power players and said, give me his body. We're gonna put him in a, in, in a tomb we've got. Wow, are you willing to identify with Jesus? Are you willing for the powers of this world to know that you follow Jesus? See, that's what it's about. And so when you and I are in our sweet spot, okay, we recognize every day, I did not save myself. Now, I willingly, I willingly, I, I participated with what God was doing. And see, that's where we get confused. We do have a participation level with God. His spirit nudges you. He says, don't go there, and you don't go there. His spirit nudges you and says, you need to go over here. You need to, you need to, and you go. See, that's, that's why we talked about the habit of obedience. We talk about the, the habit of worship. We talked about the habit of, of, of prayer, the, the habit of rest, the habit of, of generosity. See, these habits keep us in our sweet spot. That's why we've been taking this time. If you missed any of it, go back and listen to the other ones, okay? Now, now why is this important? Because when you and I, when we enter the kingdom of God, we say that sinner's prayer, but now we have to live out this life. And, and the sinner's prayer is not everything. It's just the beginning. And, and, and it, it changes the way you live. And you and I have to repent. When, whenever whenever um, the kingdom of God comes in, we have to change from what's, what's comfortable for us because sometimes our comfort level is actually ungodly behavior. And we have to, we have to be a part of this. Uh, I, think, I think what's important is that you and I understand who we are in this new identity, okay? So when you become a Christian, when you become a Christian, you're born again, and now you're part of God's family. Now, Jesus is our king, right? 
So what does that make us? That makes us princes and princesses. Wow, you just got a promotion. You just came up. You may need to go change your style. You may need to go shopping today. Jennifer will say amen. (laughs) You know, I'm a prince. I'm a princess. See, that's what it means to be a Christian. I now have another identity. And, 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 and uh, you know what else it says in Scripture? Well, here, I'll show it to you. It's, it's in, in Peter. Peter writes this to us, 1 Peter 2, 9. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Notice it's royal. That's your prince and a priesthood, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. See, you are transformed for being born again. You used to live in darkness, and now you live in light. You used to be just uh, of, of the flesh, but now you're born of the spirit. Now you are a princess. Now you are a prince. And so if, 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 I, were to, if I were to do that with you, it would mean that we'd put a crown on you, wouldn't we? We'd put a crown on your head. You know, Jennifer, she's forced me to watch The Crown on Netflix. You know, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, okay. So I've watched all the crowd now. I've, I've watched every episode. Uh, trust me, we started with Queen Victoria. This has taken quite a while, all right? But can I tell you something about it? This is what I've learned. This is what I've learned, that everybody who's part of the royal family feels the tension of being in the royal family. It's not easy being royal because everybody's watching you. And they, they, they know, I can't make a mistake. If I make a mistake, everybody knows I made a mistake. And they act like I shouldn't have made a mistake. And I'm human. They feel this tension. I mean, they watch the little kids. They, they, they're constantly feeling this, this, this. And see, this is the tension that you and I feel as Christians. Can I be honest with you? It's why you and I sometimes don't tell our friends that we've become a Christian. Because we're not so sure we want to look like a Christian. Because we've all heard it. We've all heard it. We've heard people complain about Christians. You know, they're all hypocrites. They make mistakes too. We never claimed to be Teflon. We never claimed that we would never make a mistake. I mean, Jesus' disciples, goodness gracious, you watch them and it, it ought to be, I mean, it ought to be pretty clear. Disciples can be duds at times. And that's not what we want to be. You see what I'm saying? And so you and I living in our sweet spot, sometimes we think that, well, I'll just be quiet. I'll be an undercover Christian. But that's not, that's not helpful. See, when we talked about this, we said, you know, the little habits will change your life. Setting your, setting your shoes by the door will remind you that I'm going to go for a jog today, right? Well, see, if you and I, if we put our crown on and our crown says that we are a prince or a princess, and that we are a priest or a priestess. And and we wear our crown, it reminds us that we are royalty, that we are prince and princesses. And see, when we put our, when we put our, and that's why this New Testament talks about the helmet of salvation. See, you and I, we lean in to a new identity. And and the reason we talk about a crown, in the the ancient world, they had a royal royal a laurel wreath for people that won in the Olympic Games. And and, and see, you wear this, you wear this to remind you that you are a different person now, that you have changed, that you have a new life. And so the New Testament, it talks about our helmet of salvation or a helmet of hope. So we put it on and then it causes us to think about the world around us differently. And so we take every thought captive, what's going on in the world. And because we're, we're taking every thought captive, we're like, well, that, that doesn't fit royalty. I'm part of the family. I'm not allowed to behave that way. And sometimes it's not easy because it'd be so much easier to, to go back to the old way of life. But you and I, we are, called, we are called to live every day in our sweet spot under this identity, under this strategy of living. And so we put on the helmet of salvation. Now, do you know what a priest is? You know what a priest does? A priest helps people connect with God. That's what the priest did. 
They, they, they were doorkeepers. They were helping people in. And in the same way, you and I, when we serve in the children's ministry, in the youth ministry, when we, we lead a small group, we're helping people connect with God. We're, we're, we're leaning in to what it means to be a priest, a priestess, to be helping other people. When Jesus looked at the disciples at the end of Matthew, he said, you are going to go make disciples. He's, he's calling us back to the priesthood of all believers. Now, this is what happens. Most of us, we become a Christian. We love the idea of being royalty. It makes us uncomfortable, but please don't expect me to be a priest. I don't want to disciple other people. I'm not worthy. And we take our hat off. Listen, God wants us to put our hat on every day. God wants us to walk around with our head held high and our our shoulders back, and and we're going out. I'm going to be victory. I'm going to have victory today. I am not a victim of this world. See, I have a new way of thinking. I have a new way of living. I am a victor because of Christ Jesus. Jesus died on the cross that I might be holy, pleasing to God. Jesus gave his life for me that I could live for him. Yesterday, I'm I'm on my phone and I just decide to go through X for a little bit, formerly Twitter. I don't know why we have to keep saying that, whatever. And, 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 And I see this post by Franklin Graham, all right? And I'm like, cool, Franklin, I follow Franklin Graham. Shocking, right? And, 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 and Franklin does this post, and, 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 and he's getting beat up over it. I'm like, people are complaining over Franklin's post. And I'm like, what has he posted? And this is what Franklin did. He said, I went to McDonald's. Did you know they have a new healthier burger? It's good. And people are beating up over this. And I'm like, I'm reading their post. They have all sorts of negative things about McDonald's. Haven't eaten there for years, blah, 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 blah. I mean, people think their opinion matters. That's what I thought at first. And they feel like they need to share this. And I thought, why did Franklin even post that? It's because Franklin probably is always posting something about a Christian worldview, giving a scripture giving encouragement. And Franklin went to McDonald's. I don't know if he went through the drive through or sat down. And he probably thought, that was a good burger. I actually did something normal. I'll just post that. Maybe people think I'm normal. They expect me to be like daddy. And I ate a McDonald's burger. And you know what he found out? They don't want him to be normal. You see, this is the struggle that you and I feel. We want to be liked. We want to be liked. And we want to be like everybody else, and you need to know something. I wear a crown now because of Christ Jesus. And they may not like it when I look just a little bit normal. I've had people run into me at some store in town, and they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know you wore a ball cap. I don't on stage. (laughs) Unless I'm wearing P and P, you know what I'm saying? And see, see, you and I, you and I, we want to. We've got to. We've got to change the way we approach life. Now, what does that mean? That means in order for us to engage our sweet spot in living for God, we have to separate ourselves from our old way of life, okay? And we have to engage what it means to live for Jesus. See, Nicodemus. Nicodemus was getting all of his value from his wealth and his position among this religious system. And Jesus was saying, nope, it's not your wealth and your connection to a religious system that'll get you to heaven. It's a relationship with me. You've got to start all over again and be born again. And so how do we do that? Well, I'm going to give you the three keys, okay? The three keys. I'm going to tell you what they are, then we're going to go through them and unpack them. The first one is repentance. The second one is uh, crucifixion. And the third one is deliverance. Repentance, crucifixion, and deliverance. Now, the reason I want you to see this is because many people go to church their whole life and they only hear a little bit about the first one. And they never get trained in how to apply the second and the third. Some of us we get taught them, okay? So let's start with repentance. The reason we start with repentance is because no one can be born again or saved without repentance. 
And that's why I say, when we say the sinner's prayer, we're just cracking the door. It's, it's not everything, okay? Because when John the Baptist came, what did he say? He said, repent for the kingdom of God is here. When Jesus started preaching, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is here. When Jesus sent out the disciples, he asked them to go preaching repentance. And he said, heal the sick uh, and deliver people from demons, anoint them with oil. Okay, that's what Jesus said, all right? And then when, when the church starts in Acts on the day of Pentecost, Peter gets up. Peter gets up. So Peter, the whole church is gathered in Jerusalem at Pentecost and they've been praying and people start speaking in tongues. I know, freaky moments going on, right? And the people say, what's happened to you guys? You are different, okay? And Peter gets up and he explains. He says, listen, this is the power of God because Jesus, the one that was crucified, you saw it. It was just 50 days ago. He was killed here in Jerusalem. They buried him. He rose again, and literally hundreds of people have seen his resurrection. He's ascended to heaven now, but you need to know, Jesus was the Messiah. That is what Peter preached on that day. And they, their hearts were cut to the quick, and they said, what do we do? What do we do, Peter? And Peter said, you need to repent, he did not say, you say the sinner's prayer and you're good to go. No, he wanted them to understand, you have to have a change of thinking and an adjustment in behavior. That's what repentance is. See, when you repent, you acknowledge, I was behaving wrong. I misbehaved. I was doing wrong. I was wrong, okay? And so, Yes, there can be a confessional aspect of that. Sorry, I did not get my homework on on time, right? So, so we, we, we can confess that. But, but, but repentance is actually more than that because repentance has this change in behavior that comes with it. So let me give you an example of, of repentance, okay? What, what, what we have to do, we have to repent before we can receive the gift of God. Now, in a relationship, you and I, well, let me give you an example. You may have a relationship with somebody, and this friend is a good friend. You love them. They're good people, right? But the last four times we've gotten together, every time we've gotten together, they were late. They left you sitting there waiting on them. First time was 10 minutes. Second time was, 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 was 15 minutes. The last time was 30 minutes. I sat there waiting on them. And they finally come in, they finally come in and they say, I realized something today. I realized something today that I have been treating you with disrespect. That, that I have not taken you as a person as valuable. And I've wasted your time. I've made you wait on me. And that's wrong. I've been thinking of myself as better than you by my actions. I don't think I'm, I'm better than you, but, but my actions have demonstrated that to you. And I'm here today to tell you, I apologize. I, 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 I wanted you to believe I was your friend, and then I treat you like that? That's wrong of me. And so today, I'm coming to you, and I want you to see it in my face and in my eyes, and I want you to know, I've changed my thinking about my showing up late that you are way, way, way too valuable for me to show up late to, to be with you. And that's disrespectful. And I will never do that again. I'm telling you this verbally that I have repented, but so that you know that I am serious, so that you will know that I mean it, I, I would like to offer to you. I thought about it on the way over here. The last few times we met together, that would be an hour minimum of the time I've wasted in your life. And so I would like to come to your house this week sometime. And I'll, I'll do any chore around your house. I'll do laundry, I'll iron, I'll wash windows, I'll clean floors, I'll do toilets. You pick. I'll give you two hours of my life because I owe you minimum of that because I've stolen from you. And that's ungodly. That's inappropriate because you're valuable. Now that's called making restitution. Whoa. Whoa. If you had a friend that did that to you, you'd say, let's start tonight before you uh, get off this bandwagon too quick. 
my car needs washed, and I want it detailed. And I like that paste wax that goes on hard and comes off hard. None of that spray spritzy stuff. You hear me? Now, let me ask you this. If Christians all over our culture started repenting, what would it do? Woo! Everybody in the neighborhood want Christians around. Man, my lawn got done by my neighbor. Why? He repented again. This is awesome. See, when, when we repent, it takes seriously not only ourself, but our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. Because see, God said, you have to love me first and love your neighbor. And repentance impacts the world in which we live. When Peter says to them, repent and be baptized, do you realize that everybody in Jerusalem saw this crowd of 3,000 people go out with the disciples into different parts of the city and they got dunked in the water, water? And you need to know something, they were already killing Christians for being Christians. You think they were owning their faith? I know people have been going to church for years and they have yet to be dunked in the water. Why? Well, it just makes me a little comfortable being in front of people. That's part of your repentance. It's part of you, you acknowledging God publicly and taking seriously your faith. And I realize some of us are extroverts and some of us are introverts, but we all have to learn. I have to change my thinking and my behavior. We have to repent to receive, okay? And that's why this is important, okay? Now, you may have been taught that in your Christian history. Many of us were not. Repentance is just about confessing, oh, yeah, you caught me. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have done that. That is not repentance. Getting caught and acknowledging you got caught is very different from saying, I got caught. You were correct. I was wrong. I won't behave that way again, all right? Now, the second, the second key is what we call crucifixion. Now, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you must take up your cross daily. He didn't say once in a while when it feels good to carry a cross. He says daily. That means that every day I have to put on my helmet of salvation and I have to go into the day knowing, oh, man, I might have to die to myself today. What looks good to me? See, when you carry your cross every day, it means you recognize that you may have to die to something. The context, Jesus says this several times. The context in at least one of these cases is a young rich man. He comes to Jesus, and in this conversation, Jesus says, well, you need to, you need to get rid of some of your wealth and come follow me. And, and he's like, oh, no, I got to go home and take care of mom and daddy because I'm waiting on the inheritance to come in. I'm, 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 I'm signing them up for, I don't know, to die quick so I can have their money. No, Jesus recognized in this guy's heart that, that he is just about this world and the flesh. And Jesus knows you've got to become a part of the body of Christ, okay? So, so what does it mean for you and I to die to something? Well, let me, let me give you an example again, okay? Maybe, maybe growing up, you grew up in a home where lying was no big deal. Oh, it's just a little white lie. It's just a fun. It's a fib. It's all right. You're at work and your boss says, hey, I thought you were going to send me that email with uh, uh, such and such on it. And you go, I did. I did. I sent it to you already. It's probably in your junk mail. Here, I'll just send it to you again right now. And you know you're gaslighting your boss right now. You're full of what I cleaned out of my barn yesterday. Yeah, buddy, that's called a lie. But you've been doing it all your life. It's no big deal. I got you the email. Is that appropriate as a Christian? See, crucifying the flesh means I recognize that I have looked to ungodly ways to get me where I want to be. And I'm, not, I'm okay with that. Oh, it's all covered under grace. 
you will have Christian preachers that will tell you this is no big deal. You cannot build a marriage on a lie. You can't build a business on lies. You can't. And so for you to crucify that flesh means that, that you have to say, oh, garbage. You're right. I told you I would send that to you, and I didn't. I apologize. And you're going to have to crucify your flesh because your flesh is going to tell you, tell you to lie. That thought is going to come into your head. Just lie to them. I'll get it to you right now. But you can't. You want to know why? You've got the helmet of salvation on. You're a prince, and you're, 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 a, you're a, a priest, and you're like, oh, no, take every thought captive. That's an ungodly thought to lie. See, we, some of us, we've been greedy. We've been greedy in our flesh. We, we, these, are, these are fleshly things that we have to take care of. And so when you and I crucify the flesh, we recognize. And so there may be an aspect to that that has repentance in it. You have to go back to your boss and you have to say, hey, boss, I just wanted you to know, I, 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 told, you, I told you that I was going to do something. I didn't do it. I repent. And, and because of that, I want you to know I'm going to work extra today to catch up on all the things I haven't been doing. And I know I'm not clocking in for that because I've already stolen from you and I've lied to you. That will change the world. That is sweet spot living. That is repentance. That is godly. And this is why the church, the, the church is not taken seriously outside the church because they're expecting us to behave that way. You hear me on this? This is important because when you and I, when we allow the flesh to keep running our life, when we keep, we, we keep behaving in a fleshly way, it, it, it will destroy us. It will destroy us. And so when you and I, um, you know, we know that we're not supposed to behave in certain activities online or watch certain things. See what I'm saying? We have to set up passwords. We have to set up systems to crucify our flesh. You have to decide, is, is God's word serious about the way we live? And are we going to live according to his standards? Or are we just going to fudge on this? This is why people have been... been saying some amazingly ungodly things, okay? So we first, we said repentance. Seconds, we talk about crucifixion. And, 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 and when I talk about crucifying my flesh, you know, I told you the story of my grandfather during this series about how he had these two mules that he loved and they got in between him because he said, you know, they were so important to him that, that they became more important than God. And so he sold them. See, when we crucify the flesh, we recognize that there are things going on in our life Maybe, maybe, um, maybe you were harmed when you were a child, okay? And because of that harm, you thought it was okay to be angry or you thought it was okay to be sad. You thought it was okay to be grumpy. I don't know, you know, what happens is we have these wounds in our life and we just, we accept ungodly behavior in our life because we think, well, what was done to me is wrong and so I'm allowed to behave wrong because of that. And you have to crucify that flesh. Crucify the flesh. The third one is deliverance, okay? Repentance, crucifixion, and deliverance. Now, this is why this is important. Most of the time when I talk about deliverance, people's heads are like, oh, not me. I've seen the movies. I am not possessed by a demon, my life is not controlled by a demon. Listen, that kind of deliverance does exist. But let me ask you this. Do you think that evil could present itself to you and try to talk you into doing something as though that would not be that bad? It'd be okay. Or do you believe because you're a Christian, that could never happen to you? Could you explain to me how Jesus... Jesus could be tempted by Satan and you're not better than Jesus. See, I know a lot of Christians that live under the imagination, well, I said the sinner's prayer, Satan can never bother me now. Woo, I'm good to go. No, you may need to be delivered from an idea. 
You may need to be delivered from a spirit, and this is how they gain access to you, okay? I'm just going to give you a couple examples because we have time. I only have so much time, okay? So let's go back to the lying because we talked about lying. If, if, you, if you have been a repeated liar and you continue to lie, you see that lying is an acceptable solution to the problems in your life. What you're doing is you're leaving a door open in your life for a spirit to always come to you and say, you get out of this one. All you got to do is tell a lie. And you've made room for that. And so, yes, you may need to repent of lying. You may need to crucify your flesh, but you may need to say a prayer, Lord, deliver me from that lying spirit. Because God, I have. I've become known as someone who will lie at the drop of a hat. I'll lie about anything. I, 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 God, it's terrible. God, would you set me free? Now, that is something you have to lean into. See what I'm saying? See, sometimes people, they, they, get, they get this all confused. They, they, they think that crucifixion of the flesh and deliverance are the same thing. It's kind of funny. They're different. Listen, the flesh gives birth to the flesh and the spirit to the spirit. That's what Jesus said. That's what we said last week in Romans 8, okay? And sometimes you have to crucify your flesh. You have to die to an area, and then sometimes you need deliverance. Let me tell you a funny story, all right? I was a kid. This is when I was going to church, and we had this, this church dinner, and after dinner, we're sitting down to eat our dessert. And this woman pulls up her dessert, and she says, I just cast all the calories out of this dessert in Jesus' name. I looked across the table and I'm going, sister, that ain't working in my mind, okay? I was smart enough to know not to let it out of my mouth, okay? I knew that she was deceiving herself, okay? See, you and I cannot do in the spirit what only the flesh can do, all right? Now, that being said, what my sister may have needed was this. She may have a root cause somewhere. Something that gone on in her life that had told her, food will heal your hurt. Hmm. She was looking for comfort in food. And if she would go to the Lord and say, Lord, I need your help. I need to repent of looking. I see, I've been thinking wrong, God. I've been thinking that food would solve my problems. And I, I want to break that in my life. And Lord, I'm going to crucify my flesh. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to work on that. But Lord, I need you to deliver me from the lies that have told me for years that I'm unimportant and that, that it's okay just to have, have this. It'll make you feel better for a little while and then it goes away and I feel terrible. See, what you and I have to understand is you need all three tools to be delivered to be set free. And see what Jesus said, Jesus walked into to Nazareth and he said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he hath anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted and, and set you free. See that word there is deliverance to set you free. And so when we talk about deliverance, we're actually talking about a powerful move of God in your life. And I've seen people delivered of, of all sorts of things. People get delivered from lust and people get delivered from, from greed and people get de delivered from lying and people get delivered from from these painful hurts in their life. And that's because they come to their sweet spot and they say, Jesus, I know you died on a cross for me. And God, I, I've been living in a way that's not pleasing to you. And it's breaking my heart. And I know it's breaking your heart. Would you help me, Lord? And see, when you, when you start going to the Lord, he can heal that brokenness. He can heal that. But I know so many Christians that, that, that are not willing to do the hard work of, of going before him and, 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 and saying, God, this is what I want. But if you'll set up the habits in your life, if you'll begin to come to close to Jesus every day, if you will worship him, he will deliver you. I had a friend, I was talking to him this week, uh, we grew up together, and, and, we, and we, he was telling me a story, his story again about when he came to know the Lord, and, and, and um, it was, it's so interesting 
Because before, the, before he became a Christian, he had a filthy mouth. Filthy mouth. And he said, oh, I was awful. He said, I was like a sailor. And if you're a sailor, I mean no offense. He said that, not me, all right? And, and, and he said, uh, about four weeks after I came to know the Lord, um, some guys came into my dorm room and they hazed him. They, they, they harmed him. They were brutal to him. Inappropriate behavior, okay? It was, a, it was a thing at school, you know? And he said, when they got done and they left my room, he said, I said, thank you, Jesus. He said, it dawned on me at that moment, I did not use one foul word. He said, I ran down and went to the guy who led me to Jesus, and he said, it's true. I'm saved. He said, what do you mean? I know you're saved. I was there when you prayed the sinner's prayer. He said, you don't understand. I went to my room that night, and I cried before God. I, I, I pleaded with him, and I confessed all my sins when I came to know Jesus. But today, when they beat me up, I didn't cuss. I didn't give them what for. I didn't say a thing to them because he said, Jesus had changed me, and Jesus had changed my tongue. Now, you have to understand something. That's supernatural. That is the supernatural power of God to deliver you. And it's because he walked through that. Now, I, I know people, I've prayed for them, and they've had to do the hard work of crucifixion to get off of cigarettes or something else. You understand what I'm saying? And I've prayed for other people, and they've gotten delivered immediately. That's just the way that works. But what you and I do, when we put on our helmet of salvation, when we put on our hat and we say, okay, God, you're mine. I'm going to take every thought captive. And God, I realize that I'm saved through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that I'm a new creation. But God, I'm here to do business. How do you want me to use me today? And you're praying to the Lord, and he helps you look through your life. You live with your hat on. You live every day with the helmet of salvation. I'm a new creature. But if, if the old nature begins to rise up in you, the flesh, if, if somehow something, can I tell you, can I tell you, this is how we have to deal, this is, this is, can I, why we have to deal with demonic forces, okay? Sometimes we have demonic forces because of repeated sin in our life. That's all we talked about, the lying. But sometimes we have to deal with demonic forces because of an abuse, because of harm, because of a trauma, something terrible that's happened to us. Several years ago, I was reading a book, a book by a Christian author, and he, he tells about how he was counseling a young man. They, they, they brought this young man to him, um, a teenager, and, and, and this, this, this young man has been, been clawing at himself. He's been cutting himself. He's been physically harming himself. And, and the counselor says, what? You got to tell me a little bit, you know, the, we're worried about you. You've been harming yourself, son. You, you, we, we don't want that for you. We, we want so much better for you. Tell me about it. And the son begins to talk about it. And he says, why do you do it? He says, well, it makes me feel better for a little bit. And he says, oh my, that's, it's not good, son. That's not going to help you. It's not a long lasting solution. And he says, well, when did this start? He said, it started just after my birthday. Oh, really? What happened on your birthday, son? He said, well, you know, we had a party. They gave me gifts and all that stuff. Well, what, what do you think happened that would cause this to start after your birthday? He said, well, my father gave me a gun. Your father gave you a gun? He said, yeah. Does that gun mean something special to you or to your father? Why did he do that? He said, well, that was the gun that my brother took his life with. He said, oh, son, I'm so sorry. I don't know why your father would do that, but I want you to know that gun is not because you're invaluable that you need to die. That, that, that is not good, son. And he began to talk to the boy and unpack the feelings that he had that had gone on for years between he and his family and his father. And, and, and he began to help him. And he said, today, we're going to tell that spirit of suicide to leave your life. Okay? And, and, and 
he prayed with him, and that boy got deliverance. He got set free. And see, this is what happened. There's, there's times in our life, yeah, there's an evil. Sometimes it was put upon us. Sometimes it was our own foolishness, us playing with evil. We did, took it lightly. We didn't know that, that, that evil was as bad as it was, and we just started being rebellious, and we started being bad. You see what I'm saying? And sometimes we got to go back, and we need people that are godly people who can help us have deliverance. When I'm talking to you about repentance, when I talk to you about crucifying your flesh and, and deliverance, these are tools that you and I come back to on a regular basis. This is why the church, this is why we have communion. This is why we come to the cross. It is the keystone to our salvation. It is what puts this all together. You and I cannot be delivered. We cannot crucify the flesh. We cannot repent without the power of the cross. The keystone is this top stone in an archway. When, when Jennifer and I lived in Jerusalem, we used to go in and out of Zion Gate. Every day we would go through this gate. That's how we got to school and back to our apartment. We had this, this tiny little apartment. It's not even fair to call it an apartment. It was a tool shed that they turned into a rental unit, all right? And, and we lived in this tool shed and we would go back and through through Zion Gate. Now that was important to me because I thought, wow, God, I get to live on Zion you know, right there in Jerusalem. You go into the city of Jerusalem and you see all these arches wherever you go. This is just down the street from where Jennifer and I lived. You see the archways, you see the keystone. It's that, that one in the center at the top that holds everything together so the structure can live on top of that. See, the cross is, is what gives you and I the strength. It, it brings us together between, between faith and works. It puts us together we, through faith in the work of God. Our faith is built up on top of that. And the church is built on this. Look what it says in Isaiah. Can we go back to that one? I want to show you that. So this is what the Lord, Lord God says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The one who believes will never be shaken. See, when you and I put our faith in Jesus, we, we, we get this cornerstone. And it sets in our life and it gives us stability and steadiness. And so every day when you put on your helmet of salvation, you're reminding yourself that cornerstone is resting on my head. And I, I will live my life not living by faith in myself, but in the one who loves me and gave his life for me so I could live in this world and be stable and strong. And that's why this is important. In your notes, I gave you a list of nine things the cross does for us. And I want us to read that because we're going to receive communion because right now, I don't know, maybe, maybe you need forgiveness or maybe you need to forgive. This is going to be for you. Maybe you need healing. Maybe you need acceptance and love from God. This is what the Scripture teaches us that Jesus did on the cross. Jesus was punished that we might be forgiven. Jesus was wounded that we might be healed. Jesus was made sin that we might become righteous. Jesus became poor that we might have abundance. Jesus became a curse that we might receive God's blessing. Jesus bore our shame that we might share in his glory. See, you don't have to live with shame anymore because of Jesus. Jesus was rejected that we might be accepted. When I think about that boy and the rejection he received from that birthday gift, oh, just to show him that he's been accepted and loved. You don't have to win anybody's approval. Jesus is approved of you. Jesus died that we might have life. See, the cross is the keystone, and when the church receives communion, we're saying, Lord, I'm put together. My head is covered with the truth of who Jesus is for me. So today, we're going to receive communion. If you're at home, grab it. And, and, and what we want to do is we just want to establish God's authority in our life. In, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says this. It says, this is Paul speaking to the church at Corinth. He said, for I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. Now notice this, Paul says, for I receive from the Lord what I pass on to you. 
Well, he wasn't there when they had communion in the upper room at Passover. He didn't come to know the Lord for much, much after that. He was on the road to Damascus. He was persecuting the church. How could he say that? Because Peter and James and John taught him this. When Paul had tried to kill them, they forgave him and he became a part of their body. And he said, they said to him, they said, hey, what we receive from Jesus, we pass on to you. You're just like us. You're one of the princes and one of the priests. He said, wherever you go, make sure the next generation, the next group of believers knows that they're part of God's family, that they received it directly from Jesus. There's no one in between. You don't receive your salvation from the church. You receive your salvation from Jesus. You receive your deliverance from Jesus. This is from him. So when we hold up the bread, we're saying, Jesus, you're the bread of life. You've saved me, okay? Grab your bread. Lord, we thank you for this bread because we don't deserve it, but you've given it to us freely. May it be life to us. May it be like manna in the desert. May you guide me and lead me and teach me. This is our prayer as we receive this today. In Jesus' name, receive the gift of God. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this is the cup of my covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus was saying, I'm going to die for you, boys. But it's okay. Because I'm going to rise again. And if you have to die to something, if there's a selfishness in you, something ungodly, you need to know if you die to it, if you give it to Jesus and he helps you crucify that area, he's going to raise up new life in that area. And that's why we receive this. We know that. Let's thank him for this cup. Just say this, say, Jesus, I thank you for this cup. Receive the gift of God. Lord, I thank you that you've blessed us, that you love us that we are forgiven, that we are loved. And it's our prayer today, God, that wherever we go, we will give away your life and your hope to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, God bless you. Uh, have a great day. You know, next weekend we start uh, Relationship Goals. Be with us, we're gonna have a lot of fun. We're going to learn about relationships from God's perspective, okay? Hey guys, if you have enjoyed what you've been listening and been encouraged in your faith or somehow God has answered a prayer from being a part of uh, the Church Next Door online, do me a favor, shoot me an email to pastor at tcnd.org. This pastor at tcnd.org or like me on Facebook, send me a message. God bless you. Have a great week. Hope to see you soon.